The exciting thing we want to talk about is evidence. Evidence. You know, when a, a jury looks at whether a certain issue is to be decided one way or another, what do they look at most carefully? Say it with me. Evidence. That's right. And so what we want to talk about tonight is all kinds of amazing, powerful, even shocking evidence. Evidence for Christ and at a more fundamental level, evidence that there is a God who made us for a purpose, who is our Creator, and who sent Christ as our Redeemer when we uh, took, as it were, through Adam, took that slide down from holiness and an intimate relationship with God, and then we got the cancer, as it were, distributed in the human family. God didn't leave us that way. He sent Christ to be our Redeemer. So what we want to do is to show you through fossils, through some biblical and even, uh, you might say, intuitive or even philosophical evidence, and DNA evidence. We're going to talk about DNA. You know, they talk about juries. Juries nowadays will look at the DNA evidence as to whether a certain person was in this scene or in that, uh, let's say, uh, venue when the crime was committed. So DNA is a snippet. It's a thread of inheritance. And it has a very interesting string-like character, but it's like a series of characters in a, in a tweet. I just did my first tweet last week. I'm on Twitter! Yay! And uh, of course, the C.S. Lewis Society, our ministry organization, our, our mission board, has had Twitter account for two years. But I haven't written them, but I wrote my first tweet. 140 characters. Well, 140 characters like a very short snippet of DNA, and every letter has to be right. Otherwise, it gets scrambled, right? That's what you have, but you have three gigabytes, three billion letters wound up in every cell. Three billion, 3.1 to be exact, letters of DNA wound up in each cell. And those DNA letters are blueprints to organize an incredible army of intricate machines that are even duplicating DNA. If you go from the very you know, beginning of it to the end, and shows the complete workflow of DNA being processed and even being used, a copy of it, being used outside the nucleus in another area of the cell and being read through a powerful machine. This is all so advanced, high technology. And all this happened by chance. A, B, C, all by chance. Have you ever heard that phrase? No, I don't think so. We know high-tech machinery implies high-tech designers and manufacturers, by the way. But somebody has to think up how to make these things happen, and all the little intricate parts themselves have a code to form each individual piece of every machine. Our ministry, the C.S. Lewis Society, has a radio program that you can access any Saturday. I actually uh, verified that it was uh, playing today. And it's uh, from the San Francisco station KFAX. So if you go to kfax.com at 2.30 any Saturday, just go to that website, click on the Listen Live thing, where you see my picture up in the corner of your computer screen. You can actually listen to a half-hour interview with a scientist giving evidence for faith. So that's an invitation to jump on your computer, or your, you can actually catch us uh, using the iHeart radio system as well. Just put KFAX in your search screen. <coughs> Our logo there at the uh, right side of our screen is the Narnia lamppost surrounded by the flames of the Holy Spirit in a form of DNA. Yes, in the form of DNA. Because we believe God has given witness of himself through that amazing molecule which has information embedded along the backbone. Like I said, like a tweet, but much, much longer. Like an infinitely long email. So let's go and look at evidence in stereo. This is going to be the focus for tomorrow morning. Because evidence in stereo means that there are two sides. First of all, there's Scripture. We all know that God reveals Himself in Scripture, but there's also evidence in another book that God has written, and that is nature. Have you ever thought of nature as another parallel book of God? It's amazing. You remember the psalm that David wrote? Psalm 19, chapter 19 in Psalms, verse 1. The heavens declare... Say it with me. The glory of God. So the heavens are speaking. And that's the whole point of that beautiful psalm. Well, 
We're going to be talking tomorrow a lot more about this evidence in Scripture. We're going to bring in nature, some more evidence in nature that I'm not covering tonight. But for an example, Zechariah 12.1 is, I would argue, one of the most powerful passages in the Old Testament. Let's just click through it real quickly. The Lord is speaking, who stretches out the heavens. Stop there, thank you. The Lord is speaking, who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundation of the earth, and who forms the spirit of man within him. Look at that. Progressing from astronomy, the heavens, to geology. We were just looking at the, is it Pali Outlook today? Pali. And, the, and I won't attempt to pronounce the name of the valley. It's a new ooh something. Okay, anyway, uh, I'll have my, my uh, Hawaiian lesson later on this week. Uh, but <clears throat> the foundations of the earth were, were established in a u- what unique way here in the Hawaiian Islands. But the, God goes from then geology to psychology. And that's the spirit of man within him. If you want to know about anything in these areas, astronomy, geology, psychology, name it, biology, anthropology, go to God. He has the ultimate answers. And he uses science as well. Let's leap to the New Testament. Romans chapter 1. This is perhaps the most famous verse in the whole Bible on creation. And it's very powerful because it tells us for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, notice this, His invisible attributes or qualities have been seen, specifically His eternal power and His divine nature. And the result is that uh, being understood as these qualities are from what has been made, men are without an excuse. They say, oh, I don't see any evidence for God. Just look around you. You'll see it everywhere. So those are maybe two high points from the Old and then the New Testament. Let's go into this issue of the broader issue of existence of God. We showed a snippet of a film on DNA and how DNA cannot be formed by a chance collision of molecules very powerful film. I just uh, handed a copy to your pastor, John. And when I um, spoke about this uh, a problem and was presenting all the details of it, and I hopped down from the platform, they showed this dubbed in Russian. It was dubbed in Russian 10 years ago. Film. And then I got back up on the platform. The, the students all of a sudden began arguing at their professor. And this lady professor kept talking you know, very, very strongly back to them. I said, what is going on? My translator said, they want to see the whole film. And she's telling them, don't worry, class, I'll show the whole film next week. And I thought to myself, what an amazing picture of what we would call soft atheism. In other words, all these students, I was told, were atheists programmed that way by their educational system in the Ukraine. They assumed that Darwinism was a proven theory. But given some alternative evidence, some other reasons on the other side of this issue, they were wanting more information. They were not hostile. They were like sponges. And I think that's so true of many people across the world today. They just want to hear a credible case for design. Whether design involves a recent creation or an older creation, I think you could make arguments, uh, cogent arguments on both of those sides. I happen to be Uh, viewing Genesis as historical. I don't think it's just a a metaphoric or or uh, poetic presentation. But just leaving that to one side, there are scientific issues that we will tackle very quickly. Let's go to the outburst in 2006, a sudden, you might say, blizzard of advertisements, of books, of TV shows, even NBC News and major newspapers got into the following three big guys, you might say, On the left, Richard Dawkins, who wrote The God Delusion. On the far right, you see Sam Harris and his book entitled The End of Faith was followed up by a letter to a Christian nation, which I'm just reading. I have it here sitting on the stage. And then God is Not Great by the late Christopher Hitchens. There's about a half a dozen other major books. So what is the new atheism saying? One key thing, and that's no evidence for God. Well, let's take a look at this idea that they're bringing out all the time that biblical faith is belief with no evidence. Now, if I thought that Christianity was a faith that basically said, try to just gin up, you know, kind of screw up your courage and your your confidence and your belief without evidence, I wouldn't follow that religious line of thought. 
If I thought that all that I had to go on was just nothing but blind hope, a leap in the dark, I wouldn't become a Christian. And I'll tell you a little bit of my story in a moment, but I think that that is the opposite of the case. Christian faith is a faith that is grounded on good evidence. Yes, we step out trusting in the Lord who revealed himself in those evidences. But we're going to talk about the evidence tonight. And specifically, I would take anybody right away to the DBR. Now, have you ever heard that phrase? DBR. Christ's death, burial, resurrection. And we could add the E if we wanted to because they're eyewitnesses. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 and 7 is where we see the DBR most powerfully presented. And Paul there not only talks about Christ dying for us, for our sins, paying the penalty, but he says he was raised and he was seen by Peter. He was seen by James. He was seen by all the apostles. And then again by all the apostles with Thomas present, we know from the book of John. And he, ta- and he goes into this tremendously powerful list. You know, that was written in a, in a genuine letter by Paul in 56 A.D. It's dated to 33 A.D in the original formulation of that list. So we're talking about evidence that's early. It's close to the event itself. It's not put together. It's not a legend. It's not a myth developed over decades. It's early, as early as the headline news or a banner that runs across the bottom of your TV screen from some news service. And so we have tremendous biblical faith. But I can hear Richard Dawkins saying, ah, that's just biased reporters. Those are people who had their... Their, their lives were changed somehow, and they just went with this one side. Well, everybody knows that you're going to make a decision for or against this new message, right? If it's a life-changing message, you either have to believe it or reject it. And so to say we need unbiased you know, witnesses is absurd uh, demand. Let's talk about uh, the more gentle or subtle type of evidence. Joy, according to C.S. Lewis. You ever heard of C.S. Lewis? Okay, Oxford, Cambridge professor later on. He died the same day that Kennedy, President Kennedy, was assassinated. Did you know that? Interesting little fact. November 22nd, 63. I was sitting in junior high uh, history class of all places. I'll never forget it, but I didn't know that this famous Oxford professor had died the same day. Well, his life for 20 years was that of a running atheist. He was running from God. Lewis presented reasons for faith about 10 years later. After he rejected his atheism and became a follower of Christ, he represented on BBC radio one night a week for a period of five weeks in 1941. He presented his case, and he actually was going to call it the art of being shocked. They didn't use that phrase, but I think it's a cool phrase. Do you like that? The art of being shocked. I think it's wonderful. And what he meant is there are reasons for the skeptic, for the secular person who's just dismissed God, there are reasons for them to really, if you look at it, to be shocked. For example, he says that right and wrong is a key question. Is there objective right and wrong? Are there values and and absolutes out there? And he says, if you look at it carefully, everybody believes that, let's say, uh, rape is wrong, that um, child-torturing babies for the fun of it, is a horrific thing. That, that, uh, that uh, you know, racial, um, uh, siding with one race, trying to kill Jews by the thousands or millions is a horrific uh, travesty and blotch on human history. Those things are objectively wrong, and we all know it down deep. Well, if there are objective moral values, then God must exist, and he proved that through his opening uh, section of Mere Christianity. And then he began to talk about the shock of Jesus' remarks about himself. We're going to be talking about that in just a moment. I think that I would like to share my story because you may say, is this valid? Do these reasons really have an impact? Well, they impacted me back when I was 19. Let's show what I look like. That's me at age 19, a freshman at Princeton University. And I was an atheist at the time. I was wanting to prove to everybody I could that Darwin was right. And if you were a Christian trying to promote your creation stuff, well then get with it. Wake up, smell the coffee, right? Smell the roses. And Darwin was right. And it was through a loving group of students and one graduate who had spent time with me, patiently reading scripture with me, sharing with me his faith, that after a period of six months, at the end of my freshman year, I realized that it was true, that Christ was who he claimed to be, that I did have a need, I was a sinner, and I received Christ, and at that point, my life changed completely. 
I was still a Darwinist for about six months. I still believe that, well, God worked through Darwinian evolution, but then that, as I looked at the evidence in that area, that changed as well. So that's where we're going to talk about, is some of the, initially just some of the biblical reasons for faith, and then we'll go back into this issue. Well, uh, says, um, you know, Richard Dawkins, you can't go with that. Uh, one of my favorite places in the Bible is Acts 26, 26. You know what I like? is when the Bible has the same chapter and the same verse. 26, 26. Say that with me. 26, 26. So Acts 26, 26 is where Paul, he's in house arrest in the city of Caesarea Philippi, not uh, too far from the Mediterranean coast, and he's being pulled into something like a Senate hearing like we would have today in the U.S. Congress where a, a famous a person who's in, been doing something weird and they bring him on in and they, they put him at a panel and all the senators are up there investigating what has happened. And so in front of Festus, uh, and these are all Roman authorities, the king Herod and his wife, Herod Agrippa, are there. And Luke vindicates Paul's testimony. Now what is Luke's purpose? Luke shows throughout the book of Acts where Paul presented the truth of the Christian faith in front of the top intellectual and political authorities of the Roman Empire. I think that's kind of cool, don't you? It's like, it's like Paul is invited to go to Congress. Paul is invited to go to Wall Street. Paul is invited, invited to go to Harvard University. They're interrogating him, and he's giving powerful, evidential basis for the Christian faith. That's throughout the book of Acts. Acts is spectacular in that regard. Well, what do they say? Well, at the one point, Festus... The Roman governor says, Paul, you're out of your mind. And that is both a, re a gesture and a, and, a, and a signature of uh, the next point. This was not done in a corner, Paul says. What does he mean by that? This was done under the glare of the authorities of the Roman Empire. They know all about this. And you might even describe this as an X-File. Have you ever seen that movie or the movies? There was a TV series as well, The X-Files. Remember Mulder? And Scully, the woman agent, said, oh, she's always th figuring things are just, you know, scientifically provable. Mulder says, no, there's something spooky. There's something real. Maybe it's ETs, you know, who knows about the, the, the plots of those programs. But I'm trying to bring out the parallel here. This was an unsolved governmental X-file that they could never get to the bottom of. And the reason is that God intervened and raised Jesus from the dead. No one stole the body. There wasn't a mistake about the tomb. He was seen by eyewitnesses and his body's, uh, if you will, empty cavity, something like a cocoon left over from those strips of cloth as if the mummy was there and then the mummy just vanished and passed right through the cloth. Of course, the mummy is not a mummy, but the raised body of Jesus. And so we see, I would say, the, end of, the example here in Acts 26, 26 of the ultimate X-file. Well, let's move on. Let's think in terms of what the strangeness of, 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 that Lewis would point to all the time, Lewis would point in many of his writings to the strange claims, the shocking remarks. He calls it appalling remarks. I didn't want to use the word appalling. I don't think they're appalling. Well, I guess you could say they're appalling if, if, you're, if you're thinking that Jesus is just a nice little moral teacher. But when Jesus says, I am the ultimate source of moral wisdom of the entire universe, an ordinary sane person doesn't say that if they're just a nice moral teacher. Either he's far less than a good moral teacher or he's far more than just a mere moral teacher. Either, either he's the God of heaven and earth who created us, or he's a liar or a madman. And this is the argument that Lewis uses with great effectiveness. Why, do, why does he say that? Because Lewis could say that because the, the statements of Jesus are just shocking. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. John, chapter 8, verse 58. Truly, truly, it means it's an important statement. Listen up, guys. Before Abraham was, that's, you know, prior to that pre-existence of Abraham, that means if this is uh, 30 or 33, depending on which date you take, go back to the time of Abraham. When is that? 2000 BC. So he says, before Abraham, I've been around, I've been active. And he says, not I was, what is the phrase he used? I am. I am is the clear cut Verb, verbal statement of Yahweh, the name of the Old Testament God. So he's actually, as it were, killing two birds with one stone. He's proving two points with one statement. And it's a very powerful statement. Let's bring another one. Oh, it's already up. Jesus says, of course, to Martha, 
And at this point, Mary has joined them. Lazarus is in the tomb. And he says very powerfully and very encouragingly, I am the resurrection and the life. And then he goes on and says, He who believes in Me shall live even if he dies. And everyone who believes and believes in Me shall never die. You know, I remember hearing that when I was in high school. I was still an agnostic. I was sliding toward atheism. I was getting ready to go off to Princeton. It was my great goal of life to go attend this Ivy League university and become a chemist or a doctor. And I remember hearing that. And as an agnostic who didn't believe in miracles, I was just shocked. It just hit me to the core of my being. And I'm thinking, you know, I really did fear death, not as much as I did when, uh, as a college freshman, my friends were being shot up in the rice paddies of Vietnam and giving their lives. And, and their, their bodies were being shipped back one by one to Columbus, Ohio. But I remember thinking, wow, if that is true, that changes everything. If that is, if, if what Jesus said there is absolutely rock solid, verifiably true, then I don't have to fear death ever if I could have a relationship with him. I didn't maybe think it in those terms, but I remember just being staggered at the thought that's contained in that promise. Well, let's go ahead and just bring in uh, how the new atheist might, might attack. Uh, the new atheist would say, oh, you don't, you don't need to think anything about this. Uh, Richard Dawkins, for example, says Jesus probably just was misled, mis sincerely misled. Let's think about that for just a moment. Does that make sense? Jesus had a lot of nice teachings, but you know, when it came to calling himself God, he was just a little bit off. You know, if I said that I created the universe and all of you 10 minutes ago, and I created you with all the memories that you, you know, you think you have these memories, and I just created you with those memories intact, you would go call the psychiatric, you know, agents of Honolulu or this area, because I surely should go into a mental ward. Jesus could not have been just sincerely misled. Two seconds later, in the same book, The God Delusion, he says, well, he probably never said those things in the first place. What is his basis for that? He spends no time, just, just blurts out, well, he probably never said that. Oh, so all the disciples just gave their lives for a lie? They, they risked their lives for, for a concocted lie? And all the disciples made up a story about the women coming to the tomb? I mean, if I was going to make up a story about Jesus, I would have the, the bold, courageous disciples discovering, right? Not the disciples cowering behind closed doors, locked doors, and it was the women, much to the chagrin and embarrassment of the disciples, the women who had the boldness to go. No, the women who could not be legal authorities in any kind of testimony, in any trial or hearing at that time. It was the women. Yay, women. Okay. It was the women who went and who discovered the body and who had the first contact with Jesus. I say, good for them. That story would never be invented, and we all know it. Then that's why it rings with utter salient truth, bedrock factual truth. So uh, the idea that Jesus was sincerely misled, ridiculous. Uh, about the same time that this new atheism attack, they started running ads on uh, uh, bus lines. Uh, there's probably no gods, so stop worrying and start enjoying life. Notice that how they qualified it. There's probably no God. That's the only advertisement I've ever seen with probably in it. You know, this plane will probably get you to your destination. Think of that. This drug will probably not kill you if you, you know, imbibe it. You know, it will probably cure you. No. I mean, I think it's very revealing. Would you agree? Do you want to get on the atheist bus? I don't, I don't think so. I think that the probably is revealing something. You know, and they're saying, don't worry. Well, that's interesting. So your concern is that God might exist, so you can now start to live life if you're, if you're just going to just embrace atheism. Well, you ought to have good reasons, and I would say there's no good reasons for embracing that point of view. Now, they, they'll attack God, especially God of the Old Testament, very vociferously and nastily. I, I, I didn't want to put this quote in here, but I'm putting it from a part of... Um, Dawkins' book, Richard Dawkins. The God of the Old Testament is arguably, he says, the most unpleasant character in all of fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a pestilential bully. And I've left about eight of the adjectives out that were almost too gross to use here. 
Now, that's interesting. He says the God of the Bible is, is just misbehaving. He's a really bad guy. Hmm. This is the same God who stepped in time after time to forgive Israel and to even step, as it were, way out of the, the ordinary and send missionaries, remember, to Nineveh. Well, specifically one missionary named Jonah. This is the God who is very gentle and pleading with the people of Palestine over 700 years to repent before he finally had to send in Joshua and clean out the area that had been taken over by gross child sacrifice and all kinds of horrendous religious practices. 700 years pleading with the people to repent, and they would not. So there's, if you study the Old Testament, it is one long tale of a God who loves mankind and who reaches out to the extremities of His grace and kindness and goodness. And that's one of the key themes. It's repeated eight times, a key, a key phrase from Exodus 34. I don't have time to go there. So I think that what's ironic is that, is that Richard Dawkins will say this, and two minutes later he's saying the following statement. Look at this. His moral standard, he says, is this. The universe, we observe, has precisely the properties. Notice this. The universe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, uh-oh, no evil, and no good. Nothing but pitiless, blind indifference. Well, wait a minute. Richard Dawkins, I thought you just started maligning and attacking the God of the Old Testament as ill-behaving, you know, poorly behaving, as a bully, to use your word, as a, a control freak. But now you're telling us, you know, you're just two minutes later in, a, in an honest moment, you're saying, by the way, I don't believe in any good moral standard, or there's no good or evil, just pitiless, blind indifference. Which is it? It's either one or the other. You can't have both. So we see that the new atheism system is just completely internally uh, at, at odds with itself. It cannot hold together because it is a construction of an angry attitude toward the God who actually loves us first. So let's see what happened. I want to bring, this is now the transition from this biblical evidence to this more scientific. I think what's happened is that the people of the United States and the entire world are wrapped up often, not always, but often in this kind of blanket of thinking that the God of the Bible, if He exists, is just kind of a personal subjective wish. There's no basis in empirical scientific fact. Okay, so I'm going to shift gears. You see that? Okay, a little that was not very well done. Uh, but I'm going to try to shift gears and bring you into the science very quickly. We're going to put, go to high speed and we're just going to go through some scientific points to say that the evidence of the Bible is there but the evidence of science is just fits with it so well. So you have the evidence of the Bible and you have also the evidence of science. And I want to tell you a story of how this came out when I lectured at this university at the base of Lion's Head in Cape Town. Do you see the cluster of buildings there? That's the Harvard of Africa, University of Cape Town. In the year 2010, my wife and I were uh, invited there to um, this Jubilee Church and the um, school system. My wife and I spoke there to the high school teachers. We spoke to parents. She spoke to women and children. I spoke to the uh, various uh, groups in the city. But the most important uh, lectures I gave were at the University of Cape Town. And this was fascinating because I had four days in the snake pit, what they call the snake pit. It's the central um, auditorium where guest lecturers are invited to come from 12 to 1. You have an hour, you present your case, 40 minutes, and then they tear you apart for 20 minutes. A lot of fun, right? So the, the biology professors came out. The Atheist Club was there. Everybody was out, you know, just gunning for Woodward. It was exciting. And so as I presented the case for, uh, for creation from fossils, DNA, cellular machines, and fine-tuning, I also added a fifth point, our experience. I mean, our only, uh, you know, experimental evidence that I can say is in my own life is when I receive God, Christ, into my life and God through the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside and He changes me. So that's the experience that we have, okay? So I went running through all the points such as at fine-tuning of galaxies and the universe itself and the expansion rate, 
I talked about DNA and the digital code. It's like a computer code and it couldn't come about by chance. And then we even have these little digital tags, these switches that are like dimmer switches uh, on the side of your uh, living room wall. You can turn things up and down. Mousetrap, like complexity, is seen throughout the cell. You ever heard of the mousetrap uh, example? You need five parts for a mousetrap, right? You need the base, you need the hammer that does the squishing of the mouse. Please forgive my violent language, okay? You need the all-important spring to propel the, the hammer. You need the holding bar to hold back the hammer into its position, and then the all-important sensitive catch. And that springs the whole thing into action. Now, how many mice, if you're going to evolve this step by tiny step, how many mice are you gonna catch if you just have a platform and hope that a mouse is gonna hit its foot on the platform go flying through the air and then strike its head on the, on the floor and die. Okay, that's, maybe that's our hopeful scenario. How many mice are you gonna catch with just a platform? Zero, okay. Add the, add the holding bar. Maybe you hope that as the mouse flies through the air, it'll be impaled on the holding bar, okay? How often is that gonna happen? Not very, not very often. Okay, let's throw the, the third piece. Let's put the, uh, the hammer in. Okay, we don't have a spring, we don't have a holding bar, but we got the, okay, well, you got the holding bar now and the, and the hammer. Are you gonna catch any mice? No, not likely. You get my point? You don't have any functioning mouse trap until how many parts are in place? Five, all five. So the mouse trap is complex in an irreducible way. You can't reduce it. And this is called irreducible complexity. That's the phrase for the night. Irreducible complexity, say that with me. Irreducible complexity. And you know what? There are tons or dozens and dozens of, of components or, or machines in your cells that are like the mousetrap. But instead of five parts, they have 40 or 201, you know, 38. And that means none of them could be evolved step by tiny step because the function doesn't arrive until they're all there. Everybody with me? So I was explaining this from the work of Dr. Behe, the biologist up at Lehigh University. And they were like, well, what about that? So I got through uh, the flagellum. I talked about the 40 parts that are featured uh, in the book Darwin's Black Box. The, the flagellum is an outboard motor on the back of bacteria. It could not have evolved because all the 40 parts are needed. I talked about the blood clotting cascade that requires 20 different protein activation switches in your blood in order for a blood clot to be set up. Did you know that? The oxygen wakes up the first protein, turns on the second, activates the third, goes over and wakes up the fourth, turns on the fifth, uh, sets in motion the sixth, which uh, activates the seventh, and so forth. And let's go to the end here. The last piece of that, of that cascade is what sets up the clock and then prepares it to be scooted away later on. Is this irreducibly complex? It turns out, yes. Have Darwinian theorists ever come up with one idea as to how this could evolve? You can move your heads right and left like this, okay? No, okay? They haven't come up with the slightest idea. It is a thundering silence when you go into the literature and look for the evolution of the blood clotting cascade. If you had one of those 20 proteins missing in your blood, guess what would happen? You would bleed to death next time you, you cut yourself. So that's another example of irreducible complexity. And as I was giving these arguments one by one, this one student, Tom, kept standing up every day and asking this question like, you know, how can you say these things when all the scientists have proved that you're wrong? I said, well, give me one example. Well, all the scientists, you know? And then he kept coming back up the next light, night, uh, the next day rather, he would uh, erupt with a question. Third day, first up on his feet with a question. So fourth day, here he is raising his hand one more time and his question this time was interesting because he prefaced it with the following statement. He said, well, I wanna thank Dr. Woodward, and I think others would too, for coming all the way from Florida to Cape Town to present the first evidence we've ever heard for intelligent design. I thought, hmm, something's happening here. But he says, couldn't God be the upper story, like the penthouse of the universe? And so God is part of the universe, but he helps to create the things in the universe and therefore, God is, is in there as a subset of the universe, again, like the upper story of a big skyscraper. I said, interesting thought, but the problem with that is that if God is part of the universe, and if the universe is not infinitely old, but came into existence back here at some point in time, 
then that means that God also had to come into existence if he's part of the universe. And then that God and universe combo then needs another cause or producer or creator for it. And his answer, his response was very revealing, I thought, and very intelligent. He said, oh, I thought that was very intelligent. Okay. <laughs> and so um, at that point, we went on to the next question, and someone else jumped in, some, a third person jumped in, and afterwards he came down, and he was in a cluster of students uh, wanting to follow up with more biblical input, and I gave him uh, some one more final point, and he, he waited until everybody was gone, he came up. He said, Dr. Woodward, there's this really interesting species of bacteria that, that, that invades a certain kind of mushroom. And this mushroom with the bacteria, if you grind it up in, in warm water, it makes a really powerful spiritual experience when you drink it. I said, okay, interesting. He said, I'll get that information to you. I said, right, oh, whatever. Um, so he had a very interesting response. And I think, he, again, he symbolizes a student who had never before heard a case set forward from science for an intelligent designer. And I think there's so many like that. So in our time, last uh, few minutes together, and I will wind up very quickly, I want to just give two main arguments, two main lines of evidence, if I can do that. Just briefly, just run, run through the questions, why we assume that we evolved. Many people believe that there, there was an older idea of the watchmaker. I don't know if you ever heard of the idea, if you find a piece of, of um, rock or granite or stone, you don't assume anything has, anything has formed it or made it or manufactured it, but if you find a pocket watch, you immediately assume that it was designed. The same idea we saw in the mousetrap. Darwin came along with this theory called the blind watchmaker, nature forms you and me and everything living by chance, working through natural selection. And so this idea of Darwin uh, takes on the form of some of the trees he sketched first in this notebook, later on in his book. But the branching tree of life eventually developed into this modern theory of macroevolution. Macroevolution just means large scale, everything connected, okay? And his idea he brought that we want to try to critique as we close here, his idea is that natural selection is driving these branches out. Natural selection is just creating and, and, and adjusting and tweaking and molding things. It's just a wonderful, glorious kind of creator substitute. But it's working on random mutations. By the way, they don't never really, in these theories, um, Darwinian theories, explain where the first cell came from. But that's a separate theory. Are you with me? OK, so let's go ahead and just talk very quickly about the cell and um, some of these problems and just trying to come up with changes by chance. Uh, by the way, I'll just mention this in passing. Darwinian theory began to go into a downward spiral in 1986 as a cause by this book. Michael Denton, an Australian, actually trained in England but living in Australia for the last 30 years, wrote a book, Evolution, A Theory in Crisis. Have you ever heard of this book? Very, very powerful book. He's still living. And geneticist Michael Denton looked at 12 lines of evidence and came up with a conclusion that Darwinian theory of evolution is neither more nor less than the great cosmogenic myth, that means creation myth, of the 20th century. Now we're in the 21st century. Has anybody come along and rescued the theory? No, it has gone downhill from when he wrote this book in the, in the mid 80s. So let's just see what is the principal problem with the theory. I'll just mention the one that Denton brought out, and that is the problem with mutations. After all, what is a mutation? It's a digital error. It's a typo. It's a glitch. Have you ever typed a message, maybe on your phone, a text message, and you sent it, and you realize one of the letters was changed? Sometimes it can be very embarrassing. Okay. Um, I, I, just, I just think it's, it's absolutely hilarious when I got a message that was so mutated and glitched where the v verbal, you know, the voicemail my wife left was taken by Sprint, you know, the Sprint phone that we use, and it was turned into a text. You want to sh see how badly mutations have messed up this message? This is a text message I got from my wife. Anyway, meaning you are maybe on vibrate from your meeting. I'm coming home from Sam. Yes, I'm getting very. That's the beginning. We're really doing well. I'm grabbing her meaning very well. Next, I was just wondering if your home at home download on the, I only got it or not. 
Everything is becoming, uh, you know, extremely clear at this point. Okay? And then finally, the kicker is, I left the baby dog out and she told me you were going to go home. There. So I thought you could be out of, you know, Moro, okay, five. And that's the end of my wife's message. Very, very understandable, right? Okay. This is a brilliant representation of the problem of mutations. The problem of mutations. You cannot get an, an informational string of letters, which was beautiful when I listened to it on the phone. I understood every word. But Sprint technology was geared toward in, inserting mutations from the verbal to, to text. And this happens to us all the time, and I think it reminds us how weak the cogent or the credibility uh, of Darwin's theory is just on the outset. Let's go and, and just mention that they've tried to argue that the design is poorly designed, that eye, the right, retina of the eye is poorly designed, and they said that some of the rods and cones are, are, are put at the bottom of the retina, and this is a bad news for, for our um, seeing, our, our excellent sight, and this is false. We've seen that the little units that slough off of the rods and cones are like calluses, would clog up the interior vision of the eye. But as it is, there is a whole retinal tissue layer which acts like as a flushing system. And this retinal tissue in the little bar there beautifully cleans out these bits of callus that comes off the rod and the cone cells, and they don't cloud up the interior of your eye, and you can see beautifully. Isn't that wonderful? So it's not poorly designed. It's brilliantly designed. And even those yellowish... Uh, cells that pass through the retina have recently, in the last five years, been discovered to be uh, an optical fiber system that gathers the light by the hundreds of millions of fibers, passes them through the retina, and delivers them beautifully screened and processed for the rods and cone cells. This is an example right there. They're called the Mueller or glial cells. So that the arguments that were being made in all the major universities against creation based on our retina being poorly designed, that is now toppled. That's gone. That's refuted. That's been put to, be, put to bed. And I think the time is ripe for this. Some of the people were saying that junk DNA, junk DNA, DNA that is just clunky and broken and it's like 90% or 99% of our DNA is said to be junk, that was held as a major argument against creation until the year 2007 when scientists around the world began discovering that our DNA is almost all actively being opened, read, and turned into micro-machines inside the nucleus. Isn't that amazing? And this, this whole junk DNA argument is completely obliterated just in the last five years. And I say, good riddance. Well, how about the evidence from fossils? Is that the ultimate test? And this is what I'm going to close with. I have fossils here to display, including uh, a special, very interesting raptor hand claw. We have an Allosaurus finger. We have a T-Rex tooth. And we have something that even the kids kind of get real excited about, and that's coprolite. It's fossilized doo-doo. <laughs> so the kids say, ooh, can I touch that? Well, well I'll, I'll let you come up and inspect it. It's real. We actually purchased that from a fossil collector uh, in uh, northern U.S. So our fossils, the ultimate, powerful, convincing truth of creation, I think so. Why? Because when the fossil of some kind of creature, could be plant, could be animal, could be even a dinosaur, when it first appears, shock of shocks, it doesn't look primitive, it looks modern, state-of-the-art, even advanced. Notice that. And before that, you don't see a string of developmental forms kind of slowly changing and transitioning. You suddenly and abruptly see the new form appear in the fossil record, and then it settles into a rut. It gets stuck in a rut, and this is called stasis. Stasis. That means stability. That means non-evolution. Now, this is a shocking discovery, and it's been confirmed over and over and over. And this is the, the major closing development I'm going to just uh, cover very quickly. Darwin's dilemma is here that, for example, the horseshoe crab seen here dated 450 million years old. I don't buy those dates necessarily, but we'll use them. Is the first horseshoe crab and it's modern. Notice the structure here is identical to modern versions. I think we even have another example there. 
So if that's true with crabs, is that an exception or is that the rule? No, that's the rule. When it first appears, it looks normal. Let's bring in a very familiar kind of a creature. You recognize him? Seahorse. Yeah, of course it's a seahorse. That is one of the earliest fossil seahorses that's found. It looks more, more normal than you can imagine. Let's go and look at this. What does that look like? It's a turtle. Yeah, of course, it's a sea turtle. And here's the modern day sea turtle. Looks just the same. That's the earliest sea turtle. Let's go and look at another one. Those are modern dragonflies, right? Got a picture from a friend. Let's look at the earliest dragonflies. Do they look recognizable? Of course they do. They look like modern dragonflies. The only difference, some of them have wingspan of 18 inches or more. So you see, again, the pattern is just the direct opposite of what Darwin would predict. Darwin would say, and did say, we should see gradual development of these new forms. We never see them, especially in the large categories. Next on, we see a, a, a cross-section of the fossil record, Permian at the top, Cambrian at the bottom. We have the pickle and cheese, all beef patty and special sauce layers in the middle. This is the Big Mac version of the fossil record. Uh, in case you want to get a, a late night snack, this is maybe a subtle suggestion of where to go. But we see in that all important Cambrian strata, the shocking explosion, and I do mean explosion. This is what the scientists call it. And of course, it's the Cambrian explosion because in the Cambrian layers, we see such weird animals suddenly appearing out of nowhere as the trilobites and the brittle stars and just above the Cambrian, the Devonian, we see these ammonites and, and Darwin knew about this problem. He was aware. He said, I rightly admit that this is an argument that can be urged against my theory. But he recommended that we all hold on. We'll, we'll fill in those gaps. Well, that was 158 years ago. Have we filled in the gaps? Excuse me, 155. 155 years ago. Have we filled in the gaps? Unfortunately, for Darwin's side, no, we have not. The gaps are more pronounced and wider than ever today. Some of the would-be intermediate forms that have been used have been tossed aside. And so we see such examples as, in the Cambrian explosion, the Opabenia creature with five eyes on its head. It looks like a little piper cub tail and a movable grabber arm on the front of its head. An animal so ugly only its mother could love it. Okay, but the Opabenia appears suddenly and then it falls into that staying the same pattern, that stasis pattern, where it never changes. Okay, well maybe that's still an exception. No, let's go to the Burgess Shale, this uh, hillside in Alberta, near the British Columbia border, part of the Br British Rockies, excuse me, the Canadian Rockies. And there in that amazing set of fossil strata, we see this incredible gold mine appear of other Cambrian animals that have never been known, such as Wywaxia an armored slug with interwoven reptilian-like scales and then knife-like appendages sticking out everywhere. It is extinct. I'm happy it's extinct, okay? I'd hate to have this guy waddling up next to me on Clearwater Beach or Waikiki for that matter. Now, is he appearing suddenly in the fossil record? Guess. Yes, he appears suddenly. Does he fall into that rut that's staying the same pattern we call stasis? Yes, he does. You, you guessed correctly. And so, Wywaxia, again, is an example. Let me show you a few more and then we'll be done with this. Hallucigenia, a worm found in those uh, Canadian shales uh, from the Cambrian uh, level. A worm with seven pairs of uh, needle-like spines on its back, seven pairs of, of little uh, legs it would walk on. An animal so strange that scientists thought they were hallucinating when they first identified it. That's why they called it Hallucigenia. And so it appears suddenly, falls into stasis, and never changes. Again, a non-Darwinian pattern. One or two more. Uh, the abrupt appearance and stasis pattern was expanded into beds discovered in the late 80s in China, the Qingjiang beds, and they've discovered Morella, a lace crab. There's another example of the actual uh, fossil and a sketch of it. It was so serious, an outbreak of new fossils, that Time magazine did a cover story on it called it Evolution's Big Bang. And that feared creature on the cover, let's show you a picture of him, he's Anomalocaris. Most of the Cambrian animals were two to three inches in, long, in length. This guy could grow, grow to be six to eight feet in length when fully developed. Okay, so this was the king of the seas uh, with two very interesting eyes mounted on stalks and two of those grabber arms with, with fork-like 
um, appendages sticking out from him. He's a fearsome critter. And here is the underneath of his uh, body, a big round mouth that he would use for feeding purposes. He appears suddenly, and guess what a pattern he falls into after that? Stasis. Stasis. He never changes, never evolves, never goes anywhere, and then just goes extinct. This is about as non-Darwinian as you can imagine. And finally, I'll just mention very recently, just in the last couple of years, they've found comb jellies are called tenophores. It's one of the major divisions of life. They're, they're swimming with beautiful rainbow patterns in the waters off the, the Keys of Florida. Tenophores were discovered in the Cambrian strata of Utah. And guess what they found? They looked like modern comb jellies. Oh, how could that be if Darwinian's, if Darwinian's theory is, is true? The comb jelly should be evolving, changing, improving over time. They shouldn't have the modern ones discovered 540 million years back. So wherever we look in the fossil record, and these are four recently found ones in China just in the last three years, four strange new additions to the Cambrian explosion have been added. I won't mention their names here because it would be uh, just irrelevant. But I think we're seeing a, a decisive pattern here and the key is that each of these animals needed its own unique recipe, its own hard drive of DNA to form those beautiful, unique structures, those organs, those body shapes. And so there's no chance theory that explains the huge explosion of so much new functional DNA. So you have in the rock not just the animal exploding, you have a digital library exploding. You have a hard drive appearing out of nowhere that would build those animals. Do you follow? For every, every building that's built, don't you need a blueprint somewhere that the construction company used? Of course. For every Cambrian animal that appears, you had to have the DNA blueprint that was used in the, in the embryonic stage of each of those animals to build them and erect them from scratch. And so, and, and as I close again, uh, the parallel Cambrian explosion is the DNA explosion. And let's consider very briefly the DNA is a digital code. It has A, T, and C, G pattern of letters. It has a four-letter alphabet. The human genome, as I mentioned earlier, is really big, 3.1 billion letters in every one of your 60 trillion cells. That's a lot. And then 90% of it now is known to be functional. And in Cambrian critters, the estimate you had to have at least 120 megabytes, that's a million bits of information, to run their little animal uh, bodies and all the, the process, chemical, uh, metabolistic processes. That's a lot of information. And each animal needed its unique 120 megabyte hard drive written just for it. Now, think about this. Because DNA just doesn't work alone. It's turned into RNA. There's a, an example of DNA in the green. And a, a, pot, a pattern of that is copied and turned into RNA. And then RNA is used to produce what? Protein, very good. Somebody remembers their high school biology notes, okay? Okay, DNA makes RNA makes protein. And proteins themselves are very complicated, are they not? Yes, they are. They're like machines constructed out of chemical letters, like anti-disestablishmentarianism. When I grew up, that was the longest word in the dictionary. Anybody remember that? Anybody? I think, okay, yeah, you remember that. How about supercalifragilistic, expialidocious? The Mary Poppins, all right, I remember that one. Here's a word I got from a friend in, uh, in, in Budapest, Hungary. Elka kaposta sitota anetotatok. Which means you didn't make that dish out of wavy leaf cabbage, did you? <laughs> Sometimes my wife will write a little note to me, you know, in the morning, and she'll say, no wavy leaf cabbage today in your lunch. No elka kaposta sitota anetotatok. Okay, and then another friend out in uh, Budapest, Hungary, or Budapest as they call it, said, I got a better one, 45 letter word, leg is leg make sensei telenita tetlenebe technic, which means most supremely incapable of ever once being corrupted. I don't think they've ever used it in their actual, you know, <laughs> sentences. And of course, in, in Hawaii, we need to throw in humu humu, nuku nuku, apu a'a, right? You gotta have that in there. Now, if you took, I, I did a tally, all of these letters combined is a little bit over 150 letters. That is a short protein. So if you put anti-establishmentarianism, supercalifragilistic, expialidocious, elka kaposta, sitota, anetota, tog, legas, ligmeg, sensei, telenita, tetle, nebe, teknek, humu, humu, nuku, nuku, apu, ah, 140 letters. And you know what? All of that strung together 
does not even come up to the typical, or barely comes up to the length of a typical short protein. Wow. And yet how many proteins with precise lettering are in each one of your cells? Over 20,000. 20,000 times that. Some of them are actually, one of them is 34,000 amino acids in length. So take 34,000 letters, not 140 letters. That's the titan protein which is used in your muscle cells. Now when you hear this, you say, how can anyone have enough faith to be a Darwinist any longer in the digital age? It is truly amazing that anybody like a rational biologist like Richard Dawkins could maintain such faith in, in, in front of a, a, a tr freight train. You know, this is a bit like Titanic. Darwinism is like a Titanic that has set off on this great voyage and didn't expect to ever hit any iceberg on that journey, right? No problems with evidence, but I think that's what we find. Here is an actual um, highway being set up in the cell. That's a microtubule protein highway. And there is the kinesin motorized robot. He's a protein with about 350 amino acids strung together to form two floppy feet of spindle-like body and two grabber arms that can take that huge load down the highway. There we go, let's see it, see it again here. There's the microtubule highway. It can be set up and torn down as needed. And those super highways, those interstate highways, have little workers running up and down them every minute of every day, hundreds of them carrying loads on their back, much larger than they are. And these kinesin robotic workers, powered by ATP power pellets flying into their feet, are able to just transport these things and in, in just created by God out of love for you and me to make ourselves grow and develop. Isn't that amazing? My wife said, you know, no wonder I feel tired in the morning. My kinesins have been working all night. And I think there's something to that. God it never slumbers and never sleeps, right? He cares for us, and even his kinesins never slumber or sleep. So we see in the uh, conclusion, therefore, the Darwin, or we can even say Richard Dawkins, the Darwin-Dawkins ship of evolution. Is it a Titanic too? I would say it is. I think the Titanic is going down in front of us just as fast as you can imagine. And so it's a time for Christians to take courage. Share the biblical evidence. Share your experiential evidence, that zinzuk, that joy, that is what Lewis was searching for. And finally, he found it after he received Christ. Share the scientific evidence. It all converges to the same beautiful hill with three crosses. And the central cross is our Savior. God become man, bearing our sins, raised from the dead, seen by eyewitnesses, and now vindicated by the history, even of biology. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.